Welcome to The Undercurrent, your source for grassroots news. I'm Lauren Windsor. I'm back from being on summer break and I have much to share from five weeks on the road. Al Gore's Climate Reality Leadership Training and the annual conference of the American Legislative Exchange Council in Chicago, the People's Forum to End Emergency Management in Detroit, Republican Congressman Jeff Duncan's Faith and Freedom Barbecue in South Carolina, and the Americans for Prosperity Defending the Dream Summit in Orlando. At Climate Reality, Al Gore's leading scientific advisor, Dr. Mike McCracken, explained the virtues of transitioning to solar and wind energy now over nuclear and natural gas. One of the big arguments that comes up when talking about getting off of fossil fuels is why don't we switch to nuclear or why don't we switch to natural gas? What are some of the problems with those fuel sources? Well, what we need to do is do things rapidly. Um, and for nuclear, there's a, still a lot of questions about doing it. And there's a real benefit for having distributed power. I mean, so, uh, solar and renewable have tremendous benefits. Um, the problem with natural gas is we're going to have to get off it in 20 years if we're serious about climate change anyway. And so why switch to that anyway? It might be a nice bridge. Um, and, and help in some ways, but if you leak any methane out of the gas wells, that's an important climatic effect. So the question is, why not switch now? We're basically there um, uh, with respect to wind and renewables and solar right now. Environmental activist Kim Wasserman succeeded in her efforts to shut down two coal power plants last year after nearly 15 years of grassroots organizing. Can you describe that experience for us? Sure. Um, you know, basically it was, um, it's two coal power plants in Chicago. So our organization worked in Little Village and we had a sister organization in Pilsen called Perro. And we worked together uh, collaboratively for about 12 of those years, um, just in an effort to educate community members and let them know that there was a coal power plant in our neighborhood. And just really coming up with interactive and creative ideas to spread awareness about the coal power plant um, because our local officials wouldn't do anything about it. And so about uh, two years ago with a new mayor, mayoral election we took the opportunity to make this a top a hot topic and we were able to get our new mayor to make a promise to deal with them and within a year he did and they shut down last year and so we're really happy to have retired two of the oldest and dirtiest coal power plants in the nation on to alec despite having requested media credentials with ian masters background briefing and in accordance with the stated media policy i was denied a press pass to the annual alec conference I was, however, able to speak with many of the participants, including founder of the National Tax Limitation Committee, Lou Euler, and Ohio State Representative and Alex State Chair of the Year, John Adams. But as the Assistant Majority Floor Leader, if you implement the agenda for your party and, and you spend time with this, with this group, Alec, for which you're not being compensated, for which the compensation is to participate in this forum of ideas for legislation, then certainly there's some legislation that you're excited about that you'd like to implement in Ohio. I'm just curious as to what that is. Well, uh, at this point in time in my legislative career, uh, I, I just introduced a bill on eliminating special elections. Now, I don't know if that's ALEC model leg legislation or not. I also obtained a copy of the ALEC publication the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Assault on State Sovereignty. From the document, the EPA's carbon pollution standard effectively bans new coal-fired power plants by requiring them to capture their greenhouse gas emissions. Because this technology has never proven commercially viable, the carbon pollution standard, in practice, renders it impossible to build a new coal-fired power plant. Remarkably, the EPA never even tried to tether the regulation to a specific benefit accruable to the American people. This makes sense because there are no such benefits. Oh, hell no. I headed next to the Motor City to cover the unfolding bankruptcy. On the way, I stopped in Marshall, Michigan for a town hall for Republican Congressman Justin Amash. Can you comment on the Detroit bankruptcy? Would you support uh, backstopping the pensions for the public sector workers, either at the federal level or at the state level? I wouldn't support uh, doing anything at the federal level, and from, from my perspective, it's a state and local issue. But so as a Michigan legislator, you would support state? I, for, fortunately, I'm not a Michigan state legislator. Action? Well, but I'm saying a, le a federal legislator for the state of Michigan. I mean, 
I, I'm not saying you're a state level yeah, legislator. Right. I'm just saying you're from Michigan and you are a legislator. So would you yeah. support it as a Michigander? Uh, and that's that's something I'm leaving to the state and local uh, officials, not and not something I'm going to comment on as a federal official. Malik Yakini of the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network led me on a tour of D-Town Farm to talk about urban farming and sustainability. So how many people work on this farm? Uh, we have four people who are on the payroll. We have lots and lots and lots of volunteers. And then we have 10 summer interns who work 30 hours a week. A combination of working here at the farm and also doing classroom work because we're training them to be urban farmers and so they have lessons to deal with soil science and yeah. various sciences related to plant growth and production but also we're training them with the social justice lens that guides our work because we're not only concerned about developing farmers but we're really concerned about developing social activists. Structurally things have got to so radically change that it is a new paradigm that we have to create. My worry is that we don't start to make the change until it's too late. Yeah, that's a very real threat, and some scientists think that it's already too late. I, you know, I hope that's not the case, that humanity, and, and in, in all fairness, when we say humanity, really, the main culprits behind this climate change are really, you know, the Western capitalist imperialist, primarily. You know, now we see even so-called communist China, you know, being a major contributor to uh, carbon in the atmosphere. But primarily, it's the so-called developed world, which is making this... Uh, you know, spewing all this carbon, which is um, expediting uh, global warming. At the People's Forum for Detroiters Resisting Emergency Management, activists discussed the local dictatorship and the underpinnings of racism. It's a very, very challenging and historic time. And I think we have to recognize that the emergency manager is like the killing of Trayvon Martin a sign right. of the counter-revolution right. and that defeating the counter-revolution is as important as making the revolution. Right. The emergency manager is a part of fascism. Right. Now I'm not talking about fascism that Hitler was under because they needed the fascism to expand. Right now they need fascism to try to keep us in, in, in uh, chains again for the benefit of the corporations. Because if they don't need your behind the work, they don't need to feed, help you to get fed, they don't want you to have a house, and then you got the nerve to be talking about universal health care. You don't need to live. The emergency manager when he came in it was an attempt to ensure the racist domination of the banks over our city. If you read the emergency manager act, it gave them the power to break union contracts, to break every contract, but it guaranteed the payment of debt service to the banks. And bankruptcy is no different. Yesterday, the New York Times ran an editorial. The New York Times gets it wrong a lot. In this editorial, they got it right. No banker left behind. The Detroit bankruptcy case provides another example of how Wall Street wins. And if you look at the bankruptcy, they call the loans to the bank secured loan. They get paid first. But the pensioners who worked their whole lives in Detroit, who secured their pensions through 30 years of labor, they get nothing. And that's what this is all about. Out of 11 out of 12 predominantly black communities who were rated in the worst, you know, the most financial trouble, got an emergency manager or a consent judgment of something like 15 white communities that had those scores were worse. Yeah. 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 None of them got it. 75 counties told you no to emergency management. Yeah. No to austerity. No to laying off 5,000 workers in the city of Detroit. No to laying off 900 people in the city of Pontiac. No to laying off 1,000 people in Flint. And they still saying no. You gotta show up anytime that they're talking about this bankruptcy issue. I don't care if you don't have a pension. Your mama got one, your grandmama got one, your granddad. Somebody, Somebody in your family one. got a pension. Somebody in your family worked with organized labor. Yeah. Somebody owns a house. If you don't own a house, praise God for somebody that does have one. And work for them to keep there. Somebody has children. If you don't have children, you got nieces, nephews. You got a cousin that's got some children. Fight for them. 
Somebody in this room is going to need help, kids, if you live long enough. Fight for that. Be selfish. Do it for you, if that's the only motive that you have. Detroit is reflective of the melting pot that this country says that it represents. So if democracy doesn't start with us, when we've been the arsenal of democracy, when we put the world on wheels, when we created labor for everybody to be able to benefit from. So if this isn't the fight that you can get in, I don't know when you'll be ready to fight. On August 26th, Republican Senators Rand Paul and Tim Scott lent a hand in fundraising efforts to Congressman Jeff Duncan at his annual Faith and Freedom Barbecue. I spoke with Duncan afterwards about the EPA and climate change. ...to defund Obamacare, right? Uh, defunding the NSA could be Washington Amendment. Not the entirety of the NSA, obviously, but those provisions for, uh, you know, the mass surveillance of the American people. Would you also support defunding the Environmental Protection Agency on the basis that it does not have the constitutional right to be regulating our resources? So you would defund the EPA? Department of Education, Department of Education, Department of Energy, Department of Word, Environmental Protection. And so we can start by returning to a constitutional form of government, which is limited to federal government. One more power than the state. I know a lot of environmentalists are going to watch this and, and really raise hell with me in the comments section. So, what would you say to environmentalists? Do you believe in climate change? I don't believe in climate change. I don't believe in man. I believe the climate is changing, but I don't believe it's man. Uh, if you read Fred Singer's book, Unstoppable Global Warming After 1500 Years, which says that climate change is a natural occurrence after 1500 years, which is just 200 years. Um, there's seabed, ice core, tree ring data that supports all that. We've had global warming in the Roman warming period, the Middle Eastern warming period. We've seen a change. Just recently. Who's common sense? Over Labor Day weekend, Americans for Prosperity held their Defending the Dream Summit in Orlando. Featuring party notables Ted Cruz, Bobby Jindal, Ron Johnson, Rick Perry, Marco Rubio, and Rick Scott. In The Green Monster, subsidizing failure in renewable energy, panelists advocated eliminating subsidies to renewable energy. That should come as no surprise given that AFP's founder, David Koch, is a billionaire oil and gas tycoon. Both Koch and AFP espouse libertarianism and free market ideology, so I wondered if the panelists would have the same opinion on subsidies to the oil industry. You said that your, your problem with uh, green energy, with renewable energy, is the federal government subsidizing it. Would you also be against subsidies to the oil industry? I don't, obviously do not support subsidies for uh, the producers of conventional fuels, but whether or not those exist, in some sense, does not provide a justification for subsidizing renewables. If, in fact, there are economic subsidies for conventional fuels, the answer to that is to get rid of those, not to subsidize other economic forms. Later, I ran into renowned climate denier and Wisconsin Senator Ron Johnson. You have the label of climate denier. Why is that, do you think, that liberals are throwing that bomb against you? And why do they keep driving the myth that uh, climate change is man-made? Well, the extreme environmentalists, and that's, that's what these people are. I, I view myself as a very strong environmentalist. I think most Americans do. We want a pristine environment. Uh, you know, but we also rational people realize you need a healthy economy if you're going to afford pollution control. But, but the left doesn't care about that, not the extreme environmental left. They, they just, they want to control our lives. They, they don't care what a gallon of gasoline costs. They don't care what the price of electricity. I mean, President Obama, as a candidate, said because of his tap, cap and trade policies, electricity rates would necessarily skyrocket. And this is Canada Obama. Unfortunately, America still elected somebody like that. So again, they just have a mindset. They want to regulate us back to the Stone Ages. I don't know why. They want to control our lives. But I actually care about you know, the costs that an average American family incurs because of their extreme environmental policies. Oh, hell no. Bottom line, these seemingly disparate events do share a common thread. The differing approaches to dealing with or in the case of many Republicans, exacerbating climate change. Congressman Duncan agrees that the climate is changing, but he doesn't think it's man-driven. The point he misses is that the issue is not the change itself, but rather the unprecedented rate of change. 
Why is it that conservatives who tout their morality and fiscal responsibility are so liberal with the stewardship of our planet's resources, so liberal with the interpretation of empirical evidence, so liberal with scientific fact? The degradation of the environment is neither moral nor fiscally responsible. Conservatism, it's the new liberalism. I'm Lauren Windsor. Thanks for watching. Get pulled in to the undercurrent. In this world we live in, where do I begin? Won't get too far if truth ain't your friend. You